This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Happy Aloha Friday and welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host Beatrice Cantelmo. Today we will talk about gender equality issues with special emphasis on black women and girls empowerment and healing. As you know, women's human rights across the globe are one of the most pressing issues that we're faced with. The truth is that in 2017, no society in this world have been able to successfully bridge gender, gender equity. We live in a male-dominant culture and world. Gender empowerment would fill many, many obstacles, yet there is a lot of resistance to gender parity in different levels, be it in Hawaii, in the United States, or across the globe. One of the most pressing issues that we must face globally is the problem with family violence and violence against women, in particular black women and children. Women deal with gender-based violence of all forms, from genital mutilation to child marriage to sex and domestic violence. Until we as a community, country and world make an effort and, and a concerted commitment to work with programs and policies that aim at eradication of gender-based violence and pay particular attention not just to the barriers that are preventing that from happening, but also focus on equal access and opportunities where women equal access to education, health, justice and labor market, and where women's equal participation in different institutions of civil political society becomes a norm, gender inequity will be the norm we see today. Today we have a very special guest, Laleda G is our a uh, wonderful friend uh, from Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, she's a black woman, a sexual assault survivor, and an accomplished author, and also the founder of Lailada's Living Room, an organization specialized in providing ethnocentric services to black women and girls sexual assault survivors. This marvelous organization also provides cultural diverse training and services to advocates and service providers. Their mission is bold and very simple in essence. Lalita's Living Room was created to be a safe haven that can inspire black women and girls survivors of gender-based violence to reclaim their spirits, mind and bodies, and to have an equal chance to heal. On that note, welcome to our program, sister. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Absolutely. So, Lalita, to our viewers who do not know about you, do you mind giving a little background about where do you come from and uh, a little bit of how my little new, uh, living room was created. Absolutely. So I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. I always have to throw it out. I was originally born in Chicago, but I grew up in Madison. And I grew up with my mother, my brother, and my stepfather. And from all accounts, we had just this perfect family, things that were going well and love and all this kind of stuff. But what people didn't know what was going on behind closed doors and my stepfather was sexually abusing me, and it went on from about age six to age 11. And it was really something that I intended to go to the grave with. I didn't intend to tell anyone. I thought I was just gonna hold this secret. And when I was 11, I told my mother, and it was a really long journey from there to where I am now. And I think the biggest shift that happened in my life was when I became a mother. And I wanted to began to create a different reality for my children than I had and my mother before me had. And I went on a deep healing journey. And out of that came understanding that this wasn't just an experience that had happened to me, but this was a life call to work in this field and to be a gateway to so many women and girls that have just been stuck in the shadows and the secrets of sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. So uh, I see that your organization has a, a very specific emphasis on providing Afrocentric mm -hmm. services in cultural competent uh, environment for mm -hmm. African American women and families and children yes. to heal from, I mean, one of the most traumatic experiences one can possibly face, which is sex violence violence in general. Right. Uh, so why did you feel that there was a need to create you know, a different organization to mm -hmm. meet specific needs of a population 
where, for example, there is rape crisis centers mm -hmm. you know, all over the nation since 1970s and collisions in every state that's supposed to respond to the needs of anyone who uh, finds themselves in the position of being a sexual assault survivor. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what happened? Why did you feel like, I have to do this? Yeah, so we'll park at the word supposed to help everyone. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, we serve everyone, meaning that if someone comes through the door, we'll serve them. But what I learned in my own state of Wisconsin was that there was just a deprivation of black women who were, at, who were advocates. For years, there were absolutely zero sexual assault advocates in the entire state. And it just brought me to an awareness that said, you know, I grew up in Madison. I was very well versed in working cross-culturally. But I said, with the lack of black women represented in these agencies, I'm going to focus on that. Because when we look at statistics, we know that one out of 15 African-American women will report a rape or sexual assault. And I believe that a lot of that is due to the fact that they don't see people represented that look like them at these agencies. Mm -hmm. You know, in my state, there's a lot of talk and, and across the U.S. talk about cultural competence. And I just don't believe in cultural competence because usually what that means is that a white person has trained a white person to work with people of color. And I just don't know how you get to cultural competence by being trained by someone who doesn't understand the culture either. Yeah, you might be able to be sensitive, but a true competence, I think, yes. in an organization has to do with having diversity, not only of curriculum that represents really the reality and the needs of a specific ethnic group, but right. also staff. Right. Uh, it's not just the color, but also you know the understanding and the ability that other clients may have to be able to relate and to re right. build rapport and to be able to uh, you know, start this journey. So I mean, kudos for you to be able to do this. Um, and so uh, when did Laleda's Living Room start? Uh, it started about t 2010 in a very mm -hmm. formal way. But what happened was um, years before that, I shared in my church that I was mm -hmm. a survivor. It was something really kind of risque to do at the time because there's still so much secrecy mm -hmm. around it. And after I shared my story, women and girls literally showed up at my home mm -hmm. and we sat in my living room and we cried and we prayed and we worked through, you know, how they could progress in their own mm -hmm. healing. And so it kind of found me in a way by sharing my story that I meant to keep secret. By sharing it, I found that it really opened up the gateways mm -hmm. for other women to walk mm -hmm. through. So besides... Um representation uh, of uh, African-American presence, not only in programmatic development, in you know, cross segment of organizations and staff. What are the barriers that you see the black women in particular and their children, both girls and African-American boys are faced with when they have to not only seek services uh, to heal from domestic and sex violence, uh, but also from their whole uh, realm of uh, the cultural barriers that you see that may prevent someone from going forward mm -hmm. and say, I need the help. Yeah. Well, you know, historically, you know, as black people, we have learned not to trust systems. Mm -hmm. And so sharing certain information with systems has always had repercussions that come back. And so with any family that is hiding a, a, a secret of violence, you know, there's this depth of, we keep this inside. Mm -hmm. um, with black families, we have the same thing, but even more so, we don't trust the system because we don't see people who look like us. We don't believe that there are good intentions necessarily for our families, and there's like misinterpretation. And you're having so many families being torn apart and not really working to bring healing in and so there's just mm -hmm. this, this pause by a system that you just don't feel mm -hmm. understands you or represents you. Mm -hmm. So in other words uh, you still see uh, many bridges that needs to be built not only for a system that works towards uh, healing and not uh, blaming the victim and, and, and vi re-victimizing someone right. who may have to resort to the system to be able to address their issues and may find themselves with their families torn apart. 
kids may be in foster care or, or services that are supposed to be sensitive just to sexual assault response period and actually ended up wounding the person. Right, sometimes the response, the healing, the help ended up being more harmful and more traumatic mm -hmm. than a family coming together and trying to figure out how to deal with the situation themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, these are the crucial uh, services that helps people transition from that place of secrecy and victimhood mm -hmm. into survivalship and empowerment. So on that note, La what is uh, Laileda's Living Room doing as far as your programmatic uh, development and the services that are being provided in the community, not only in Madison, Wisconsin, but mm -hmm. I hear in many other places. Absolutely. Uh, to be able to Absolutely. So one that. of the initiatives that we took on is Black Woman Heal Day. Mm -hmm. So in April 2015 was the first year. I was thinking about what is a way to bring black women across the nation together and have the feeling of power and community that is so important to the black community. And I came up with this idea, which seemed simple at first, and it got really complicated um, in a good way, but providing on April 1st, the very first day of Sexual Assault Awareness Month, recruiting women across the nation to host a healing gathering. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that once you begin to talk and you create a safe space where these crucial conversations can happen, there is just this reverberation of healing um, and a relief that you have in having a place where you can share. Mm -hmm. And so what I found in the first year was, as I started sharing about the day, quickly it became an international day because black women from other countries were saying, I want to be a part of this. So which countries have uh, embarked in celebrating uh, International Black Women Heals Day? Yeah. Well, we've had women in Jamaica, in several countries in Africa, we've had women in Belize, mm -hmm. and um, we've had women in the Dominican Republic and in Haiti, and just a cross section of mm -hmm. black women throughout the African diaspora really start to get involved with this. And it's been just an amazing thing. We had um, a new partner last year in the UK. So it's really growing, and that's really exciting. And it's grassroots based. Absolutely. Like, you know, black women and allies yes. hopefully can you know, join and do this. So what typically happens during black women, you know, heal day as far as activities, you know, because I, I want our viewers to get a little taste because yeah. every place, every country does something a little bit different. So. Yeah, and it's really exciting. So last year I got an opportunity to um, meet with Nikki Giovanni. And one of the things that she shared with me is really encouraging women to use that day to make meals together and to have food and to share and how healing that is. And so that was one of the new initiatives that we put out for um, this past year is like get together and eat and talk. Um, women do gatherings with family members. They do gatherings in churches or coffee houses. Um, I know here you joined me the first year and you had a beautiful event on the beach. Yeah. You know, so it's really about not necessarily doing some huge grandiose event, but really doing something that makes sense to you and the people you know and creating a space for healing. Mm -hmm. Now in Wisconsin, being the capital city, each year we do something either at the Capitol or we do something at the governor's mansion, mm -hmm. as well as having various events throughout the year. So the first year we did just one event. But last year we had about 12 different events mm -hmm. going on throughout the city for both women and girls. That's marvelous. So we're going to take a quick break okay. and we're going to continue you know, right away. Fantastic. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Doug Rawson here, folks, your host on Where the Drone Leads, our weekly show at noon on Thursdays here on Think Tech, where we talk about drones, anything you, to do about drones, drones, remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned air crystals, whatever you want to call them, emerging into Hawaii's economy, educational framework, and our public life. We talk about things associated with the use, the misuse, uh, technology, engineering, legislation, with the local experts as well as people from across the country. Please join us noon on Thursdays and catch the latest on what's taking place in the world of drones that might affect you.
Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice, Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelo, and we are back with Lailira. So Lailira, we were talking about the wonderful uh, event that happens right now, I can say, across the globe, yes. different continents. Uh, that may start, you know, really small seeds, but it is mm -hmm. taking a momentum and it is growing. And uh, um, on the one hand, I'm very happy mm. that you uh, felt inspired uh, to do this and to have that calling shared with, you know, all the sisters and brothers yeah. and allies. And uh, on the other hand, I feel really heartbroken that uh, in 2017, we still have to yeah. create a, an international black women heal day, mm -hmm. you know, to bring awareness of the issues that women face. So do you mind uh, sharing with our viewers a little bit of the cultural history of uh, uh, violence and black women, not only in this country, but around the globe? Absolutely. So when I started digging more into my own family to try to understand, you know, I realized that my mother was a survivor, her mother was a survivor. I believe that her mother may have been, but beyond her, um, my great-great-grandmother great was a slave. Once you hit slavery, I realized that every black woman in my lineage had been sexually assaulted through the slavery system. And I realized that my daughter was the only one through my lineage that I could attest had not been sexually assaulted. And I thought that was just me, that as I start understanding, I was like, wait, this is every black woman's experience that's come through the African diaspora through slavery, whether you have directly been sexually assaulted or not, you carry forth that trauma in your body, you know, because in slavery, you know, not only were, were black women systematically raped, we know men were too, but not only were black women systematically raped, but it was an economic benefit because babies that were produced from that rape were also could be sold at a higher price. So. Black women have experienced rape throughout the African diaspora in a way that no other collective group of women have experienced it. And what I began to realize was that what I experienced in the U.S. was the same thing that my sisters had experienced in the Dominican Republic and in Jamaica and throughout that whole process. And, you know, I was very intentional about calling it Black Woman Hill Day and not African American Hill Day because I wanted that bigger piece of understanding of blackness and our need for reunification of blackness mm -hmm. around this issue and realizing that we were the original healers. Right. And so there is the need for um, unity. Mm -hmm. There is the need to recognize, but there's the need also for reparation. Yes. Where do you see room for reparation moving forward? For example, if you were to cover micro perspective, like mm -hmm. in every community, if you were to look domestically as in the United States, and then transfer that to a broader level, micro level, like mm -hmm. the world, how do you see reparations, opportunities for reparations? Well, I hope, don't hold a lot of hope for reparations. So I really say, what can we do for ourselves as black women and for our girls? Because our black girls are spiraling out because they are carrying forth this trauma too. And so more than looking for someone else to do something for us, I'm really looking to empower us to do something for ourselves and especially for our girls. And I think reparations is an important conversation and it's an important concept, mm -hmm. but I don't have the energy for that. I want to sink all of my energy into empowering black women and girls to heal themselves and to be places of healing for others. So you touched on very soft spots of vulnerability mm -hmm. and uh, boundaries when you talked about don't hold much hope that there will be a big systemic change or mm -hmm. response. Right. 
or that, uh, um, that there will be enough time, resources or energy to tackle every single aspect of such a broader mm -hmm. you know, issue you know, to be able to do it. So how do we uh, empower older women, especially black women and families, so that, that we can do this ourselves? Um, I, my invitation to you is that, yes, uh, continue to work with uh, the tools and the strength that you have at your disposal. Mm -hmm. However, a big part, I think, of this shift is really also uh, being able to sit down on the table with organizations, with policy makers, with the community at large, and say, look, it's not our job to do this alone. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're really going to heal from a place of peace, and you know, we have to have unity, and that needs to be reflective in policy making, in grants that are available, mm -hmm. and then convert it into working with organizations mm -hmm. that uh, can provide uh, the services where the gap is, you know, pro, you know, is lacking right, right now in terms right. of services. Uh, the empowerment comes from a survivor to understand that how his rights are not any different or any lesser or any less important than of a, you know, brother and sister that comes from a different ethnic right. background. So I think part of the response of uh, closing and saying we're going to do this ourselves is a direct response of the systemic uh, no's and, and, mm -hmm. and boundaries that the system imposes on black people. We have right. Black Lives Matter, right. a movement which is directly a response to the lack of response and uh, how you know, black people's lives are so uh, dismissed and disrespected, right. you know, for historically, not only from the time of slavery, where, well, we, we were able to abolish slavery, but mm -hmm. Jimmy Crow was allowed to be in right. place. Well, uh, and and so like, there are so many, so there are so many layers, right. you know, of this that we still need to address. And it, just like race relations, we got major issues to go through right. and we cannot heal we cannot move forward if we don't acknowledge and if we don't have allies from the other side to recognize well, that. I think I'm a healer. And what I found is when I work in these systems that were not designed for me and were mm -hmm. not designed for my people to heal and to progress, mm -hmm. it sucks that he healing energy out of me. Mm -hmm. So I've decided that I'm going to focus more on healing and empowering other people to heal mm -hmm. and to be healers that work is important, but I think we all have to take different pieces of it because I've seen so many black women leave this field because they have been so oppressed mm -hmm. by these agencies that are mostly white women led. Not myself included. You You're, know my history. Absolutely. I've worked many years in the nonprofit sector yes. as an advocate and as a direct service provider, you know, working. Uh, to provide culturally competent and sensitive services yeah. to not they just steal your soul. black women and Latino women. And yes, it was very draining. Yes. And uh, I had to take a step back and mm -hmm. step out and find different ways mm -hmm. where my voice and my expertise and my experience uh, could not die along with me leaving the field, but could be applied elsewhere. Right. Uh, and so stepping back is healthy yes. and changing uh, directions and, and, and changing strategies is very important too. But being relentless, you know, on, and, and walking from a different place where you don't feel completely defeated, you know, mm -hmm. it's also very important. Yes. So I am yeah. relentless about healing. Yes. And I am relentless about looking to the faces of black girls and tell them that they're beautiful and that they're worthy and that their lives deserve to be lived. Mm -hmm. I'm relentless about mm -hmm. that. And I'm just resolved that there's only so much fight that I want to have against systems because we've been fighting for yeah. hundreds of years. And we yes. see, look at what we're seeing right now going on in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather put that energy there and into that place because I think we can heal mm -hmm. and then that will reverberate. 
But if we're still broken and we're still trying to fight the system, we, at the end of the day, end up being so depleted, we have nothing to bring home to ourselves, to our families. Mm -hmm. And it becomes just this vicious cycle of a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. I believe if we start with that core, healing ourselves, then for those of us who need to take on the systems, because it needs to be done, absolutely, we have a little bit more fortitude and we have more strength because we feel the feeling of the sisterhood behind us. It's not just that one person. As you know, it's often one of us in an organization, very isolated, very oppressed, and our voices are silenced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very true. I can't believe how quickly this program came to an yes. end. Uh, but uh, I really want to thank you for being here, uh, for the beautiful work that you do, for speaking your truth, uh, and just speaking like it is. And uh, I hope that you come back to Hawaii many times and that you come back to this program and Thank give you. us you know, an update about what's happening. Well, if I can give a and, shout out uh, to women to join us on April 1st. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Not just April 1st, but every day of the year. Yes. My shout out uh, in this process is that we recognize the struggles of women in general, you know, who are dealing with violence and families, but that we pay particular attention to black women and families and their children. And also there's a call for un unity. It's a call of we. We're not gonna be able to move forward uh, without everybody embracing this concept. And that concludes our Perspectives on Global Justice uh, Think Tech Hawaii program today. Thank you so much, our viewers, for watching us. And until next Friday, uh, we hope.